Hi, my name is Pat Salmon. I'm a Staten Island historian and author, and I'm here today to talk about Cornelius Vanderbilt and his maritime years. Um, very interesting family that uh, originated in, they actually originated in Brooklyn and they made their way over to Staten Island. Uh, Cornelius was born on May 27th, 1795 at Port Richmond. His father was in the business of ferrying things back and forth from Staten Island to Manhattan. And the boat that they used was called a periagua. And even as a youth, Cornelius would help his father to move the goods and you know man the boat and be an assistant, so to speak. And these boats moved all kinds of things. They moved cattle, they moved pigs, chickens, they moved people who needed to get back and forth to the city. Um, they were interesting boats in that you could use sails or oars or poles in order to, to get them through the water. For instance, if there was no sail, then they would use oars or they would you know, uh, get poles in the waters that were not too deep. The masts, when the sails were up, actually made the little vessel somewhat unstable. But still in all, they, um, they, they worked just, for the most part, fine for the people of Staten Island who were transporting goods. Now, Cornelius, as I said, was as a youth working for his father. He really didn't care about school. He gravitated towards physical endeavors, especially those that involved maritime activities. And by the age of 10, his father was even giving him substantial um, responsibility on this periagua that they ran. And according to law, it's interesting, um, I, I like to quote a source here that, about Cornelius where they said, quote, he sat square and self-reliant in the stern, hand on the tiller, eye on the main sheet. I there, Corneal, the other boatman would hail. You better watch out. That's sharks off a of robin's reef. Ah, go to hell, Cornelius would repot, reply. He was a pithy lad in his speech. In after years, the street urchins in Manhattan would wait hours on the curb just for him to pass, and perhaps they might learn a new cuss word. So we get a, a, the picture of Cornelius as a kind of, you know, rough kind of a fellow when he's a young man. And he was fortunate to have lived on Staten Island, both at Port Richmond and later when the family moved to Stapleton. He could watch the harbor, uh, watch the ships sailing by, study the weather, watch the maritime activities that were happening. And he learned quite a bit on his own, just, you know, through these observations. And there's no doubt that uh, being on the waterfront like that really stirred his, his adventurous being. You know, he'd see the ships sailing by and he, he would just study them. And he was um, desperate almost to, to pilot his own vessel. He wanted his own periagua so that he could have business on his own. And his mother knew that, Phoebe Hand Vanderbilt. She knew that, and she saw that he wanted some money, and she made a, she made a deal with him. This property that they still owned out in Port Richmond, she said, Cornelius, I will give you $100 if in a month's time you can remove all the rocks and the grass and the, and the debris from that, that farmland and plant it with corn seed. He was only 15 years old, and, and he said, I'm, I'm, I'm up for it, Mom. I'm going to do that. And she was going to give him $100 when it was completed. And don't you know that there was actually a periagua for sale and available at that time if he only had the $100? Now, this is 15-year-old Cornelius Vanderbilt. He's already got the wheels are turning. He's thinking, thinking, thinking. He's not going to labor on that farm and remove the rocks and put the corn seed in. He goes to Port Richmond, and he talks to all the young boys in the neighborhood, and he says, if you'll work for me doing this job, when I get my boat, I'll give you a ride in it. So he's, already he's not paying the kids. He's going to give them a ride in, in, in you know, response to their working for him. And guess what? Everything went as planned. The kids cleared the field. He bought the periagua and even, you know, started in his own business, business for himself. Um, Cornelius was now ready to begin ferrying passengers to and from Staten Island on his own periagua. He charged 18 cents one way 
a shilling for the way back, which to my understanding was about 10 cents. This is more than the nickel ferry boat that we were paying back in the, in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, he welcomed both freight and passengers. It didn't matter to him. But he was so successful. At the end of one year, he went to see his mother and he gave her the $100 back for the Periagua. And he gave her $1,000 just to keep for her own. That's how much money he was able to give her from all the business that he had in that first year in business of on his own. So, um, you know, throughout Cornelius's life, he was always close to his mother. He would consult with her about business things or personal things. It was probably the only person he was ever really close to in his entire life. Um, now, Cornelius was a busy man. He'd transport passengers back and forth from Staten Island to Manhattan, businessmen. At night, he would um, transport people who wanted to go into Manhattan for a, you know, a night out on the town. And so at night, he would actually sleep in the bottom of his boat because he was going from sunrise to well past sunset. So he was literally raking the money in. Um, and he was getting stronger and stronger too, as you can well imagine, from oftentimes rowing the boats or poling the boats or lifting heavy things on and off the boats. So his physique was, was, was getting larger and larger and he actually was becoming something of an intimidating person with his, you know, his, his large body and his height and um, you know, his pithy way of speaking, as they said. So he continued in business, and, and uh, uh, he was fortunate that in 1812, when the War of 1812 took place, the government awarded him a contract to deliver supplies to the different forts that were in the New York Harbor. Castle Clinton, uh, Castle William on Governor's Island, Fort Hamilton, Fort Lafayette, what would become Fort Wadsworth. So he got this wonderful contract. So during the day, he's still transporting his passengers back and forth. Remember, he never had an empty hold either. If he was coming back from Manhattan, he was transporting anything, cloth, dresses, whatever the case may be. If he was, you know, going to Manhattan, there were always passengers, always something on the boat. The hold was never empty. So he's transporting people, and at night, he's working on this government contract. He's delivering supplies to the fort for the soldiers. Ammunition, guns, clothing, food, whatever. He didn't care what he was, what he was delivering. So he was getting more and more and more work. Um, like all successful ship captains, you know, he never, as I said, had the, had the hold empty. In 1814, two years later, Cornelius buys a small schooner called the Dread. Soon, he even had a larger boat constructed. It was called the Charlotte. His main competition in ferrying people was the Van Duzer Ferry. Abraham Van Duzer was his main competition, but Cornelius soon put him out of business. Um, they, he got so busy, in fact, that he had to subcontract. He would hire other boats and other ship captains to move some of the, the, the items and that he was, you know, had taken a contract to deliver. So the company is getting larger and larger. All right, here we are now. It's the mid 1810s, let's say. And Cornelius notices that things are changing. Sales on ships are going by the wayside steamboats are starting to become the thing. And at first he thought it was, it was just a passing fad. It was not going to last. Um, but he soon realized, you know, this, this business with the steamboats, this is going to be around for quite a, quite a while. I need to learn how to operate steamboats, how to man them. And, and so he figured, thought about it. What was he going to do? He didn't know anybody who operated steamboats, but he did find somebody. He found Thomas Gibbons. 
in New Brunswick, New Jersey in 1817. And he went to work for Gibbons. He learned everything there was to know about steamboats, how to, you know, how to, how to pilot them, you know, uh, you know, the, the safest methods, uh, what worked best for them equipment wise. He even is credited with making parts and things like that, that had never been invented before for steamboats. He was, it's, as I said, he was always thinking, always thinking. Well, Thomas Gibbons also owned a, a, like a saloon tavern boarding house, let's say, in New Brunswick, and it was called the halfway house. And he offered it to Cornelius. He said, you know, if you want to run and operate this saloon tavern, well, by all means, go right ahead and, and keep whatever money you uh, might, might earn off of it. And so not only was it a good place for Cornelius to make money because he put his wife to run it, he didn't even run it, but it was the place where he could put his family while he was living in New Brunswick. So the family, and he had quite a few children by this time, and his wife lived at the halfway house while he was learning all about steamboats. And he started making big money for Thomas Gibbons. And, um, you know, things were going really, really, really well. So Vanderbilt worked for Gibbons for about 12 years. And eventually, uh, Vanderbilt established a one-day trip between the Battery in Manhattan and Philadelphia. The cost was only $3, and the year was 1826. Vanderbilt continued to build new boats, and he also continued to buy boats and vessels that he could improve. And this was something that he and his son William H. would do for the rest of their lives. They always kept up with the latest uh, conveniences, whether it was on the boats or on the railroads. They always were, uh, you know, it was very important them, to them to have clean, a clean operation, neat operation, no junk laying around or garbage or anything like that. They kept things very nice. Um, while he was working for Gibbons, Cornelius actually was making about $1,000 a year annual, uh, annually, and he was making and putting away a tremendous amount of money. So that in 1829, he decided to move to Manhattan. This way he could focus his sole attention on the maritime businesses on the Hudson River and the Long Island Sound. And it wasn't long before Cornelius had a line of boats. Many of these, as I said before, held inventions that he himself had created. Um, Vanderbilt soon conquered the transport business along the Hudson River. Get this, for each of the five years after leaving Gibbons, Vanderbilt earned $30,000 annually. That's a tremendous amount of money in the 1830s, early 1830s or thereabout. And soon he doubled that and he was making about $60,000 a year in his maritime endeavors. One of his main strategies was always to attack the competition. He always undercut their prices and if he, was in ha if he wanted to get rid of them, he oftentimes made them an offer he couldn't refuse and he bought out the competition. Competition. Sometimes he even would sell his business to the competition, but he always got the better end of all of the deals that he was involved with. By the mid-1830s, Cornelius is very well known, New York City area, New Jersey, Connecticut, and people uh, know he's a, he's a man of the water, he's a man of in, uh, maritime trades, so he takes on a new nickname, and that new nickname is the Commodore. Between 1840 and 1850, the Commodore's wealth and prestige grew at a phenomenal rate. The name Vanderbilt actually became known throughout the country. By the late 1840s, he owned about 100 steamboats, and he was employing more people than any other business in the United States, and it was all focused on the maritime trade. Even so, he was still involved with the ferries that ran to and from Staten Island, believe it or not. But there's an important clarification that we need to make because very often Cornelius is credited with establishing steamboat ferry service between Staten Island and Manhattan. And this is simply not true. 
It was on November 29th, 1817, that Daniel D. Tompkins, who was the governor of New York State and later a vice president of the United States, he was the one who established steamboat ferry service between where uh, Bay Street Landing now stands on the waterfront not far from Lyons Pool from that location, which was referred to the quarantine at that time, all the way over to Whitehall. So it was actually Tompkins who established this steamboat ferry service. Even so, uh, Vanderbilt was still involved with the ferries on Staten Island, as was his brother, Jacob. Um, and he, they even had cousins in the business who were involved with the, um, the ferry boats. Uh, a terrible accident occurred on July 5th, 1852. Uh, there was a, the ferry landing at Clifton was really referred to as Vanderbilt's Landing. And on that date, there were two ferries. One was unloading, one was loading. And with so many people on the, the, the bridge between the, the boat and the dock, the bridge collapsed, fell down, fell to the ground. Number of people were killed, as were a number of horses. But anyway, um, not, sure, not for that long after this time, we start to see the, van, uh, the, the railroad business starting to grow in the New York City area, maybe up around Boston. So Vanderbilt's thinking about you know, railroads and, and wondering about these railroads, but he was very distrustful of the railroads. You see, he had been in an accident on the Amboy Railroad line. The car he was in went off an embankment and actually one of his lungs was punctured and he was severely injured. So he was very distrustful of the railroads. This was in 1833, but uh, even so, he always kept it in the back of his mind about these railroads. And also by 1860, we start to see a railroad operating on Staten Island. It goes bankrupt, but doesn't his son, William H. Vanderbilt, become involved with the resurrected railroad that's running on Staten Island? But in the meanwhile, um, Let's go back. Let's go back to the California gold rush of 1849. Cornelius saw this as a great opportunity for him to make money. He realized that most of the men who were going out to the, the gold fields in California were, from the East Coast were actually going through Panama. So he started thinking about it, got on his own ship, studied the situation, and he realized that he could move the, the miners, the gold, the supplies they might need using his own ships. So what he would do is he, they'd, he'd have them board or load the ship with goods in the New York City area. It, the boat would sail south down to around Nicaragua and he would transport the, the miners and the goods over to Lake Nicaragua where they would board another Vanderbilt boat and it would, you know, it would eventually think they would eventually end up on the Pacific Ocean where another Vanderbilt boat would meet them and take them up to California. And he did all of this for only uh, $300. Meanwhile, the company that was moving people through Panama, as opposed to Vanderbilt moving them through Nicaragua, he was, he was charging $600, so he was severely undercut. And that is what the Vanderbilts always did in their early years, whether it was boats or railroads. They made a fortune, the Vanderbilt family, off of moving people at that time. Um, and we have, to, we have to say that by 1850, uh, R.G. Dunn is beginning to do credit reports on, on Cornelius Vanderbilt because he is a very wealthy man. And even though um, he had all this money and fame and, and success, they, they still called him, quote, boorish, illiterate, crude, uncultured, offensive, and it would take another 10 or 15 years, as his wealth increased, that they would finally leave things like that out of the credit reports about him. Um, Vanderbilt was, uh, by the time he was 59 years old, he was the second richest man in the world. Uh, he built a ship called the North Star 
it was constructed according to his specifications. He was about 59 years old at that time, and he took him and his family and his wife on a great uh, tour, and people were amazed at the North Star. Quote, the vessel eclipsed all the barges of royalty and attracted no less wonder and attention as it sailed to all the ports of Europe. Um, eventually, on the way home, uh, the, the, there's a story that says that as the North Star was pulling into the New York Harbor, uh, Cornelius, owing to this, this love that he had for his mother and the closeness that he had for her, he ordered that the North Star, you know, anchor in the harbor and that he be rowed to the shoreline of Stapleton so that he could go visit his mother. So, as I said, he was, he was always, always devoted to his mother. Um, when he came back, though, he also found out that somebody had cheated him during his time away, cheated him of money. And he sent a note to the, to the swindler and he wrote, gentlemen, you have undertaken to cheat me. I will not sue you because the law takes too long. I will ruin you. Sincerely, Cornelius Vanderbilt. So it wasn't long by this time, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt was involved in transatlantic traffic, uh, passengers, goods. As I said, it didn't matter. 1861, we see Cornelius Vanderbilt is 67 years old. He's worth about $15 million. Um, this is the time when the Civil War starts. He met with President Lincoln to formulate plans of how he and his business could help the Union with the war effort. And Lincoln actually offered to pay the Commodore for his assistance in stopping the rebel rams these rams were sinking northern ships, but Vanderbilt supposedly refused the compensation. He returned to New York. He hired a number of able-bodied seamen to man his favorite vessel, which was called the Vanderbilt. The boat was, a, was valued at about $800,000, and it's actually a sin to call it a boat. I mean, it's a ship. And it was said to be the handsomest and the best equipped steamer afloat. He outfitted this ship with a ram and the other necessities so that it could traverse the James River looking for the Confederate ram known as the Merrimack. He never did, or the boat never did encounter the Merrimack, but Vanderbilt was still honored by the United States government for helping the Union with the war effort. And in response, Congress ordered that a medal be struck of his likeness. Now, it's at about this point that we see Cornelius Vanderbilt, the Commodore, jumping straight into the railroad business. So here today we've discussed uh, Cornelius and his maritime endeavors and his maritime start on Staten Island. So I would like to say thanks for watching and I also want to remind you that this video and other videos from the Noble Maritime Collection are on view. All you have to do is go to noblemaritime.org slash N-O-W. Thanks so much for watching.